David. Hey, how are you? Hey, doing good. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for um for doing this podcast. I've been wanting to talk to you. I've known you. I don't know how how many years have we known each other. I think we met in. Could it be? Ninety nine. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, don't know. I can't remember. I can't remember. But anyway. um, yeah, but we had similar friends, and um, um, you know, I, I mean, uh, I would see you around at different things. I, I did some trailers, you know, for you, and mm-hmm. and uh, I just like everyone was just saying, "Oh, you got this guy's amazing. He's made so many movies." And you, so you've made. I mean, in, in well, I mean, how many films do you think you've been involved with? Whether you were directing or just, I mean, where it would have to be. 200 or something, right? I mean, oh, I don't know about that. Um, but uh, I started, well, I was, you know, I worked my way up through the business, started as a production assistant over at Roger Corman's. And um, so I, 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 you know, I, I've worked on a lot of movies and I've worked with some great directors like like um, Ken Russell and Vin Vendors and people like that. So I was able to, you know, learn from some, you know, kind of James Cameron and work with producers like Dale Ann Hurd and people like that. So I worked my way up through the business, but, um, what was it like in the, in the Corman days? I mean, when you were, well, it was, it was, it was, it was good. I mean, I had nothing to compare it to. I was 18 when I started. I mean, I literally started within days of arriving in LA, thanks to Roger, who had, who I had met a, a year and a half earlier. Um, uh, when I visited LA, he took a meeting, like he took a meeting with me because he, yeah, you know, I was running this little thing called the Roger Corman Fan Club. So he he met with me for a couple of hours and was very sweet. And he said, "If you ever if you ever move to L.A., you know, uh, come see me. There may be some work for you." And, and he, you know, um, he was a man of his word and hired me as a PA. So it was really good, and um, so it worked out really really well. And um, uh, learned a lot there. And the thing is, it was the only independent film studio that was a fully functioning, you know movie studio that was producing films, um, it, you know, continually and, um, uh, had a permanent unit of crew there and, um, you know, the full structure and everything like that. So it worked out really, really well. And then you go from, um, you go from there and you, and you go from, you go from Roger Corman to, I mean, you, you, you work with so many up and coming directors at, at, at Corman. Uh, and then, uh, does that help when those, when those guys move on and, and start doing other things? Do they, they they do they bring you along and or do you just well I wasn't I wasn't a very good PA uh, <laughs> <laughs> in all honesty I really sucked at it um, <laughs> so um, I was just I mean this PA thing was getting in the way of my running a movie studio hmm. I mean I I moved to LA to be you know to be a journeyman you know uh, director but I also wanted to you know be the next Roger Corman so I wanted to you know affect essentially just be a journeyman director, you know, uh, produce the movies and then essentially be, you know, running a studio by so like, the age of 30. When so you're, when you're, a, so you're doing this, you're like, I'm going to say 18 or 19 and you're running around as a PA on these other things, but you had your own company that you were making stuff as well. I mean, Oh, oh God, no, 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 not at 18, oh. not at 18. No, no, I was strictly a, a higher gun. So I was working for just, you know, I'd go from movie to movie and, um, you know, luckily, you know, but there's a lot of guys that I worked with that went on to be, become great directors. Like, um, you know, um, on I did a film. I was a production assistant, craft service guy on Crimes of Passion, and um, my um, one of my colleagues there, and then an art department assistant was Frank Darabont. Hmm. And uh, Frank uh, started uh, getting his short film together, and apparently, it's you know, he has a relationship with Stephen King or something because he got a, to do a short story with Stephen King. So it was kind of nice, you know, um, and uh, I worked on that with him. And his very first short film was called The Woman in the Room, and it worked out really well. We all knew Frank was going to go on to do great things. But I got to meet a lot of people as a production assistant. Like I said, the Crimes of Passion, I got to, to become really good friends with Barry Sandler, who was the writer-producer on that. And he had just um, produced a movie called Making Love, um, uh, which was the first, you know, the first film of its kind, um, and I was really, really excited to work with him and Ken Russell, and you know, the, the DP on that movie was Dick Bush, who had shot Victor Victoria, wow. and Sorcerer, and you know Tommy, <laughs> movies like that. So it was really, you know, you had to work with these great people and see how they work, and 
and learn the craft and learn the business. So I just basically wanted to learn it all, and that's what you do when you're a production assistant. You're kind of assisting everyone. You know, uh, one of my friends is uh, Beverly Gray, who wrote a great uh, – she was like Corman's assistant for all those early years, and she wrote, wrote a, 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 I thought, a, a really interesting book about, about his life and, and, and work. And I was – you know, it, it, there's such a great nostalgic feeling. You see, like, all these people that have gone on to do great things, hanging out, working – uh, together, and I just wonder, is there anything like that going on now? I mean, it, you know, is is there a place where people who, you know, a lot of young up and coming directors, you know, I'm sure all working for dirt cheap, but is there anything that you can imagine going on in the world today where there's a situation like that? Well, it's a different, completely different world because back then, it was a hermetically sealed industry. Um, it was major studios, and then a very, very, very few few independents. So. For, for anyone to breach the gate, you had to go to places like Roger Corman. So, um, and Roger was a very rare situation because he had, like I said, a full studio. And so you end up working on a number of movies. So, like I said, to, uh, not only did I work with these people who become really good directors, but I worked on Escape from New York, so I got to work with John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. You know, they did um, not only all their visual effects there, but a lot of pickup shots, which I worked on. And then I also did um, um, a film called Galaxy of Terror and worked with Jim Cameron, who was the production designer and second unit director. And we also did a film called Smokey Bites the Dust, <laughs> um, the, post -pro the post production on that, which Gail Ann heard. It was her first producing job. Yeah. And uh, Gail was actually Roger's assistant. Uh, at the time, I was writing him uh, when I was like 16 years old. And so he, she was responding to my, my, my letters. Uh, and I had set up the meeting with Roger through her. I uh, also worked on pickup shots for Firecracker, mm. and, uh, which was a martial arts movie that was shot primarily in the Philippines, but they were doing pickups. In, in L.A. at the lumber yard. Because it was a lumber yard. I mean, that's what the studio was. Yeah, this so is the Venice was, location? Yeah, it was an old lumber yard, and it was called Hammond Lumber, and they didn't even take the sign down. It, they kept it up as, as Hammond Lumber, and I asked the question around, like, why why don't they put New World Studios on the and, – and, and uh, I was told that it would be best to keep it as Hammond Lumber because if you put New World Studios up there, uh, the place would probably get robbed because it, it, it sounded as though it might have a lot of expensive equipment in it. Yeah. And at the time, Venice was – and it still is, depending – on what time of day you're there, it can be pretty uh, pretty rough part of town. Um, but uh, it was an interesting place, interesting time. Uh, I was I was very lucky to get in to work on the films, and um, you know, based on that, uh, I was able to take that um, little bit of experience I had by working there for a little while uh, to go work for Ben Benders because Roger Corman had some money in a film called The State of Things, which oh. was Vim, Vim was Vim had shot. Primarily in Portugal, but was doing at least a week of pickups in uh, I love that Los movie. Angeles. Yeah, uh, Sam Gorowitz, uh, Sam, 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 the no, Sam, Sam um, Fuller, Sam Fuller, and Alan Gorowitz were yeah. in it, and it was very, very low budget. I mean, it was like a crew of eight people, black and white, you know, French cameraman. Very strange experience. I mean, I still look back. That was probably my weirdest experience ever. Just sitting at the Tropicana Hotel, which is no longer there at West Hollywood, and the production office was actually in Vin Vendor's and Chris Severnick's room that they had to share because it was so low budget and would watch game shows. But he turned the color off on the TV. Yeah. He just watched the game show, American game shows in black and white. Wow. It's a hilarious experience. I, mean, I worked on that for about a week. The, and, the, thing, um, the thing I love about that movie is that it's, going, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a science fiction film, and then I guess mm -hmm. I want to waste maybe like 20 or 30 minutes into it, it just suddenly stops, and they go, oh, uh, we've run out of money. The producer is left with you know all the money, and, and then it becomes yeah. a movie about them making a movie. And I thought it was just – I thought it was really brilliant. I always wondered, was that – you know, what – was it planned to be like that, or did maybe like – I don't know. Be, I don't know because Roger Corman's in the movie, you know. Yeah. He, he's a scene in the phone booth, I think, where they're trying to get money from him to finish the movie. Um, and I think they ended up getting – I think that might have been – you know, knowing them, or I think I know them really well, but at the time, I mean, I did spend some time with them. 
I think that might have been what happened. I, I did not read the script. I knew yeah. nothing. I just came in and I was in the system. It, it was just um, such a, an interesting idea that, like, what? Because you know, just knowing his other work, you could think like, "Why this guy is probably just." working with what he has and hey we run out of money to finish this science fiction film so the rest of the movie is going to be about the director and the crew trapped in this hotel waiting for the money to arrive i mean uh yeah that, that you that, that must be an amazing experience did you get to spend any time with, like sam fuller or any of those not you know i'd be honest with you i was so young i didn't know who that was yeah. but i did know who alan gorowitz was because he played the writer in the movie the stunt man which mm. i had seen the year prior and i really really loved that film and uh, but I didn't know who Sam Fuller was. Um, but again, it was it was it was odd. But uh, you know, I did eventually see the movie. It took a while for it to come out. With but, all uh, these guys that you got to hang out with, and all, everyone, uh, you know, I imagine you were probably a sponge at that time, just you know, seeing how <clears throat> they were doing stuff and absorbing the well, label. Yeah. Well, I had no clue uh, about how the process what the process was to get a movie made. I did not go to film school. I didn't know anything about anything and so i wanted to learn while i earned you know yeah. and uh that was kind of the way to do it especially when you arrive in la and you know i i think i arrived in la with 200 dollars in my pocket and a sleeping bag it was one of those situations so it was a it was you know i'm glad i came when i did you know yeah. <clears throat> because if i would have waited till i if i would have went to college and then graduated i would have been a much smarter much more pragmatic guy and probably would have talked myself out of moving to LA because you know right it's insane to move here it's, absolutely it's really insane I mean yeah, it's and then, very very strange and then I think about you know you had you had all these life experiences that you wouldn't have had though going through the college and just watching other movies I mean you were actually you know in the trenches and doing that thing and I want to I want to move to where you know there was a period there where your your budgets on your films were were pretty great I mean, uh, you know, you were, you know, you were working on, you know, on some great stuff and, uh, the economy was different. Uh, it was, I guess it was VHS at the time and that was a, a big thing. And then, uh, and then even probably there, there was even a peak probably when DVDs uh, first started happening with every little bit of new technology. There's, it seems to be a wave of a little spike. Yeah. yeah. Um, unfortunately with my, in my case, um, I couldn't, um, I, uh, there was, I did a film, I think the biggest budget movie I directed was just under $3 million, and it was a film called Skeleton. Right. And uh, I uh, got that movie just out of luck because I was at the right place at the right time. It's not that they sought me out and said, you must direct this film. I just happened to, you know, stumble into these things. Um, I just don't think I've ever received been given a job off a resume before in my life you know it's always been just really being at the right place at the right time and also you know some people ask me Dave you know tell me a little bit about you know what does it take to be a good director I said well learn sales they go what what does that mean I said well you have to learn how to sell yourself Mm -hmm. because everybody thinks they're brilliant now you have to sell yourself to prove to people that you're brilliant for them to hire you because there are more unemployed director wannabes in LA than actors it's a very 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 tough job to get a you know to to get and you have to really know how to sell yourself and so i go in and i whip up a spell and get the producers excited and tell them everything they want to hear without being too pretentious and i got lucky and uh, it also was back in the time where everything was shot on film there was a little bit more money involved and that you had to have experience and you know if you could figure it out also you know i i was um uh very um you know, I enthusiastic, and I wanted to work in all genres, and uh, I'm not a writer-director. I'm strictly a director-producer type. So I, I wasn't like I was going in and changing the scripts too much. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I, I wasn't a visionary. I was a journeyman, and uh, still am, and, um, and, 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 and liked it, you know. So I really, you know, I really, you know, I was a company man. I did the best I could and, and uh, worked. Uh, for some people, uh, a lot. I mean, w- once they hired me, they kept hiring me again and again. So, did it's you a, find that, that you did you find that you were getting more work just because like you were you were actually already working on a project, and then maybe just um, you know whether you're in you know the editing stage or whatever, you know, some producer would come along and say, oh, well, he's working. He's let's use him. He's there. I mean, it's just like it just you just like you said, you had to be at the right place at the right time and. Uh, a lot of producers don't like a lot of change. They like to hire the same guys a lot. Yeah. Um, so uh, if they're comfortable, they know you're going to deliver a certain uh, 
if they know what they if they have a, if they have an idea of what you're going to deliver and they're very secure in that, they usually continue hiring you if there's unless there's some weird problem. So um, you know, of the 71 or 72 movies or whatever I've directed, I've only worked for probably four people. Okay, now so that's what I want to yeah. So like, how do you yeah, how do you how do you just start doing your own thing where you're you're your own man, you know? Well, um, I don't think you're you're always a, you're always working for somebody, whether mm-hmm. you're financing it yourself or not, because um, you always want to go to your buyers and find out who they who they think is the right name to put in your movie and all that. Okay, now say so, now that's um, that's that's the thing I'm really I, that's an interesting thing because now. You know, I'm really into the monetization of, you know, like the Internet and the way, you know, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, you know, the iTunes and, you know, YouTube mm-hmm. is now starting to where you can actually on some cases, mm-hmm. I know they're doing it with the Sundance films where you can mm-hmm. pay, you know, make money from uh, from your films. So like how you know, going from from that, you know, what what's the, the track that you. Well, the bar now is changed with the internet because everybody expects everything for free. Mm. So, or at least most people do. Um, and uh, so, and if if they can't get it for free, they will find something else to look at. And so, what you have now is a lot of noise. So, you have you know 400, 500 channels on your satellite. You have video games. You have um, Netflix. You've got Redbox. You've got. It's not so special anymore. You know, back in my day when I was a kid, you had three channels on the television, and you had to grab that TV guy the minute it came in and make sure you checked every single movie that was playing in circle because that might be the only time you will ever see that film. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So you, it was a different time when I was a kid. So now everything is just so convenient. Um, that uh, and there's so much with the YouTubes and this and that. Not to mention the the criminals that are running those torrent sites. Mm. You know, um, uh, it's just suddenly monetization and internet is. I don't know if I think that's an oxymoron because I just don't know if there's really any money in the internet. My, you know, because mm. I have some films. I mean. Again, it's right now, back in the day, like in the 80s and 90s, they make a picture for a certain price, and you sell it for a certain price. You know, the arithmetic was very much you know, grade school arithmetic. It was uh, high school arithmetic. It was very simple. Nowadays, it's different. Nowadays, you might be creating content for a particular video-on-demand business that has – a hedge fund funding them who predicts that the overall content, not just the one movie, will make money over a period of time. That you know, it's a, the, the equations, the, the the paradigm is completely different. So mm. when people say, "How are the films doing?" I go, "I don't know." You know, like the last yeah. twenty or thirty movies I make, they 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 get made, they get distributed, some of them come out theatrically, they get on the they get on the uh, video on demand channels, and they go onto DVD. What the balance sheet says, is there a particular column on the balance sheet for that film? I don't think so. I think nowadays it's a much more complicated uh, equation to find out if films are financially successful. Because I do have – I've had some really – some some investors who have – private investors who have invested in some of the early films – uh, of the rep from Rapid Heart that did okay with some of the films, you know, mm-hmm. um, and uh, they come back and they say, well, what's next? What are you going to do? And I go, I just really don't know if I can tell you if there's any money in this business anymore. It's certainly not lucrative. It's certainly at my level, mm-hmm. you know, so is there, is there, you know, is there monetization? How does it, I don't know. Uh, all I know is that, you know, I've directed movies that were financed by German media funds. And, uh, you know, that's sort of some tax shelter uh, that uh, is done where, you know, German investors, high-income investors want to write off and they make the movies probably for all the wrong reasons. Mm. Um, I'm also a Canadian, so I'm making films that I think are one budget but really are not because most of this movie is subsidized by the Canadian government. Um, uh, you know, so is you know, so people say, well, why, why you know, why don't you, you shoot the movie in, in Canada where it's cheaper? Well, it's not cheaper in Canada. My, my highest paying jobs that I've ever received in my life have been in Canada. It's the most unionized country I've ever worked in, but because the government subsidizes Canadian content uh, with tax credits and all kinds of soft money and broadcast sales and et cetera, et cetera. You can finagle the numbers and make it work 
up there. Hmm. So I, you know, did like a sci-fi channel movie up there. I've done some movies of the week up there. So it's a different, it's a different um, paradigm. You know, it's a different kind of business now. It's, uh, it's, and do you it's find not about spending one dollar and making making two. It's a, it's a different it's a different deal. It's it's spending one dollar and and waiting for several years for <laughs> yeah, but, you know, or spending one dollar that that that's air because if you have if, if if half of that dollar is subsidized by a foreign government, mm. is it really a dollar? Right. Well, kind of, but maybe I don't know. So that's the thing. It's 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 it's, it's not so easy to figure it out anymore. So it's a little more difficult. I mean, I've, I've look. I've done so many of them that I kind of understand the new tricks. I know how to. I know that you know there's a million ways to skin a cat, and you know I've learned a lot about the Canadian model and the co-production model they have, and, and you know what the value is and how a Canadian content movie might be more valuable in Canada as opposed to a Disney movie, let's say. So it's it's interesting how the world works and how. You know, the business works now, but the Internet, for all the greatness and all the wonderfulness about the Internet and how everybody, it really has made it a little different because there's no, it's not a hermetically sealed industry anymore. Yeah, it's, Now I, everyone can do it. It's, it's a weird thing. I mean, in a, in a strange sort of way, uh, it's like I used to love, you know, driving in, you know, across the country and I'd stop at these small towns and go into a, you know, a flea market or a thrift store and you'd find some item that you wanted to buy. And this is before eBay, and you could like wrangle a really great deal on something in some small town, and then take it to LA and sell it, you know, for a larger price if you wanted to do something like that. Mm-hmm. And and then as soon as eBay comes out, everyone all they do is they go and see you know what an item like that goes for, and it's so all the prices everything's leveled out, and is you know, and well, there are no deals anymore. There's no deals. Yeah, um, there's no deals, and you know uh, there are internet businesses where if they make a penny. Over a million, a million items. They make a penny per item. Over a million items. It's a business, whereas no one else can compete in that business because right. they don't have. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah, no, I, I, it's a different. It's a completely different. So scarcity, <clears throat> scarcity creates value. But if your if your if your content is not a physical item, it's it's a digital, digitally delivered item. Mm. There's no, there's no, there's no scarcity because so, anyone can have it because it becomes viral the minute it hits the internet. Absolutely. So the thing I guess is, you know, is to, I guess the whole niche marketing or niche, you know, niche marketing. Um, I guess to to try to create content that's basically, you know, um, attractive to just one small vocal. Well, no, I mean, I to me, this is the deal. You, to me, there, well, there's, I don't know what the deal is. I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but this is what I'm thinking it might be: is that um, a good old-fashioned producer named Harry Novak once said, "David, there's there's a market for everything. You just have to find it." And I agree. And now you can find it. There's no excuse not to find it. Now you're hoping they're hoping that that particular market is willing to pay for what you're trying to sell them. Um, it costs money to find that market. It costs money to make the, the product, and it costs money to get it delivered to them. Um, if you can make that commerce work, great. But it's going to constantly churn because you know once things become viral, then everything you know. It's, ask the music industry. I mean, this is a oh, question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, talk about a, a, an industry that just was sucker punched. Mm. Now maybe they didn't act on it fast enough. I've never downloaded a free song in my entire life. I've used whenever I need a song or find music, I find it on iTunes. Right. Um, but I'll be honest with you, a lot of the music that I want to get is not available on iTunes. A lot of older music is mm-hmm. not available on iTunes. Um, so, but I've never ever taken the uh, stolen a song or anything like that. But there are many people that that do. You know, yeah. many people that just sort of, the, especially the young people. You know, and whatever try to kind of code breaking or code or some kind of protection for your digital item is out there, It's they're going to crack it within an hour by some 15-year-old kid in Finland who has nothing better to do, you know. Well, um, it, it's just, it's a different, it's a different world. Now. You know, I made, I made a, I made a concert documentary called Angry Blue Planet. It had Pearl Jam, Dramarama, Charlotte's in the UK. You know, it had all these, these bands and I, you know, shot on film and video and it was just this massive um, you know, thing that I directed and produced. And when we um, we were taking it around to festivals, I remember took it to this one festival and I was sitting talking to a couple other people that were running the festival. And uh, I guess one of the, the PAs came by with a stack of, 
films that had just been showing at the festival and was talking to the person they knew each other and said, and he goes, Oh, where do you got? He goes, Oh, I've got these films. I'm going to go take them to the lab and, you know, and dupe them, you know, I mean, he was going to, he was going to pirate the films that had come to the, uh, to the festival. And I look and I see my film, Angry Blue Planted in there. And I said, Oh, I'm glad you're here. Can I take this back? And I just slid the tape, you mm -hmm. know, out of his, uh, out of his hands. And, you know, and that was back in the day when they would have to go someplace Mm -hmm. And and make a duplicate, but you know how real easy, time, yeah, in real time, yeah. In, yeah. Nowadays, it, it takes seconds. Yeah. On burning a DVD, and every, now that everyone's got broadband, I tell you, it's very strange. You know, because uh, you know a lot of actors that are my films say, "Dave, could I get a copy of the movie so I can cut something for my demo reel?" And I did that once a couple of years ago, and it ended up on the internet, and my investors sued me. Wow. So, yeah, because the minute it goes viral, before you make a sale on the film, you can trouble. get in trouble. So you have to be very, very careful with how all that stuff works. So, you know, you, you can't, you can maybe make scenes and stuff like that, but these screening copies sent out everywhere, Yeah. you I, know, these DVD screening copies, I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's a weird, it's a weird world, and I'm not really sure, you know, how... You, you you see these people that say, oh, it's the future is great, and then you see the people that are in it, and it's like, yeah, maybe not. You know, it's like, it's a tough call, and um, and I, I have so many friends that are filmmakers that, you know, have spent their lives trying to make films, and, and make you know, and and are just barely getting by, but they're at the point now where they go, hey, I have to have another job just to finance my passion of mm -hmm. making films, and. Um, I don't know. I'm hoping that you know it'll all pick back up again, and we'll, you know. But I'm well, not. I, don't, I, I, this is the, you know, again. I think that it's becoming more of a hobby uh, and more of a, an art as opposed to a craft. And I think it's. Uh, but there are, obviously, there's still a lot of money in this. And if somebody whips up a spell and says, "This is what we need you to do. We need you to direct this movie," and I make a nice fee on it. Uh, for some old school, you know, delivery system like basic cable or something like that, then it is lucrative. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's every it's it, the, the thing is it's not it's it, everybody has their everybody that gets into the, this business has their own journey and will find tremendous success. Um, uh, uh, but not maybe not financially, but critically uh, or vice versa. It's it's a different. Everybody's got their own path now more than ever before. I think. Yeah, they they see it as a label. You've definitely. You've got that label, and that people will return to that. I mean, is that something that you you've planned on and creating that uh, kind, of? kind of? I mean, I I knew there would. I, well, I didn't know. I didn't know anything in 1999, but I knew one thing. I knew that uh, what I liked, and um, and that's basically what I realized is that you can try to satisfy every market you can to you know, to. to you know, to make sure your film is as successful as possible. But I'm kind of an odd bird, you know. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm I'm a guy that you know d that does love the genres, but I'm also very squeamish, and <laughs> you know, my taste has changed since I was 23. You know, yeah. um, and uh, so I wanted to do something that I thought would be, you know, a low risk venture. and do something that I wanted to see. So I did a little film called Voodoo Academy, and Charlie Band financed it, and. It did. It, it did. It did well enough that I knew that okay, maybe maybe there is a market out there. Maybe there are people out there like me that like this kind of thing. And um, uh, so I just uh, launched my own label, you know, on my dining room table in my apartment in North Hollywood, and and uh, started raising money and doing it. And the films did okay. You know, has everything been a huge success? It's been relatively successful. I'm not saying there's been any. Tremendous success. I don't know. Um, there hasn't been, a, or, you know, it's not like the '80s where, you know, which was ridiculous. Um, the successful <laughs> the '80s was unbelievable. Um, but um, those were some good days. Um, but um, um, the, uh, but it's 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 it's. I built a brand. I, I, I was lucky that early on I was embraced by uh, Blockbuster Video. They were buy, licensing my movies, not just buying them, wow. but actually licensing the films and then putting like 20 to 40 copies per store nationwide in like 8,000 stores. And you know my company logo and website was all over that movie. And so the first one especially, it's called The Brotherhood. And so I was lucky that. 
I got some good exposure. My website got really hot and, and everything. So there was a little bit of a brand, and uh, it was building. And I kept it. I've done about 20, 30, I think 30 movies now under the Rapid Heart label. And uh, it's very, it's very uh, specific in what it is. And, so your um, anniv- the anniversary of the label is coming up, isn't it? Or is it? Uh... No, it, it was in November. Oh. Um, uh, with ten years. Oh, um, that's just, that's and, just fantastic. Uh, yeah, it's constantly evolving, though. You know, um, it doesn't stick with strictly horror. It's there's some science fiction, there's some thrillers, there's some action movies. I take basically all the tried and true genres and give it my my own little spin on it. And um, uh, but what's been really really um, exciting about it is that there's been a lot of young actors that have started on the on the movies that have gone on to some really good success, like Corey Monteith, who did his first movie for me, and now he's the lead on that TV show, Glee. He's very successful. And then a kid named Sean Ferris, who started with me on Brotherhood 2, was the lead in a very successful movie called Never Back Down, an MMA martial arts type movie. And so he's done very good. You know, he's on Vampire Diaries. And so a lot of my guys have been very, very well with these kind of things. So it, it, discovering new talent is something that's, you know, it's, it's probably the most exciting thing for me just because it's like, you know, it's nice to pick, you know, of the seven or 8,000 actor submissions I get per movie, it's nice to pick the winner. Well, you know? Yeah, you know, I, um, I, was, I was, I I ran a little acting, digital video acting workshop, things for actors on camera. It was like a little thing I ran in North Hollywood. I used to run, I'm sure you, since, since I lived in North Hollywood, you lived in North Hollywood. Uh, remember the, um, uh, the Debbie Reynolds dance studio <laughs> that was, sure. I used to rent, um, I used to rent a uh, a little thing in there, and I'd, I'd have actors come in. I mean, it was really cheap. It wasn't like, you know, but I would have different guest uh, actors come in and talk to everyone. But I used to have, um, there'd be actors come in, and, and like two or three, like I, I um, do, you know, I ran into so many people that had worked with you. And, I mean, I wouldn't be any kind of prodding. Your name would just come up, and they would just talk about what a great experience it was that you made the set fun, you know, um, one of the things that a lot of these particular actors that had mentioned you would say was that it was quick. It wasn't a lot of waiting around. I mean, I guess they'd get on the set and they were surprised at how much of the work you're actually doing, but still giving them time and uh, giving them, um, you know, a space to be creative in, you know? And I don't know. It was just like your name just, just kept coming up so much during the time that I was doing that, uh, those workshops. Yeah, well, and, yeah, I just I was doing a high volume back then, hiring a lot of actors and and stuff. Well, on the movie that I did with Dee Wallace, so that Skeletons movie, it, it, that was very challenging for me um, because um, it I replaced another director mm. uh, two weeks before shooting, and so I was uh, it was a very famous director, and everybody kind of was wondering who the hell I was, and. Uh, there were a lot of you know guys in that movie like Ron Silver and Christopher Plummer and James Coburn and Dee Wallace Stone and Carol Baker and all these incredible actors, and so it was like who you know the director of Bikini Goddess, and <laughs> <laughs> so I was getting ready to direct them, and um, it was a little you know uh, they were kind of like who the hell is this guy? But uh, you know I tried to you know I learned a lot you know I learned a lot in that movie and I had 19 days to wow. do it and there was a lot of movie there to do and. Um, working with big stars and stuff, but I got to direct Christopher Plummer, you know, and, you know, it's, yeah. it's like, you know, I was, I was, I was at a party two weeks ago at Joe Dante's house and I was, I was talking to Joe and I said, you know, I said, Joe, I said, you're one of the lucky ones. And he goes, Oh, why? Because I've had a career. This, I said, no, you got to direct Christopher mm. Lee. And I said, you know, you're not a director until, you know, you can't call yourself a director until you've directed Christopher Lee. And, uh, you know, working for, you know, all over yeah. Europe on some of the, you know. On I mean, Franco's guy, films. And, we, we love yeah. to work, you know. And, yeah, Franco <laughs> and down in South Africa and everywhere. And I, you know, to me it's like, you know, but he's the last great Absolutely. horror star, yeah. you know. And um, so, uh, but I was, I, was, I was mentioning that to, to, to Joe Dante. But I guess that, you know, probably because I'm more of a fan than I am a director i just kind of always considered myself a fan first and the director second it's kind of a miracle that i can actually make a living doing well, this that's what makes it so great you know it's like you've found a passion and you're doing it i know it's hard work but it, it really at the end of the day you're doing what what you like and it's like okay well you know are we measuring success by what happened in the 80s or are we measuring can we measure success by okay i'm you know i'm not 
working in a coal mine or something, you know, and, you know, I'm actually doing something I love. I'm a fan and I get to work and see the people that I, uh, um, mm -hmm. I admire. Well, I get to travel a little bit this last year. You know, um, I did a, a movie in China and I did a movie in uh, a martial kickboxing um, kung fu movie in the Philippines and I just did a movie in Puerto Rico and um, worked in South Africa recently and London and work all over yeah. Canada and I like you know in Turks and Caicos Islands in the Caribbean and stuff like that. I love getting on That's a plane great. and par parachuting into some of these <laughs> countries and with a couple of bucks in my pocket and a camera and make some movies. It's nice to be able to you know see the world on somebody else's. Well, I, you, you are. Um, I, I tell you, you're you're inspiring, and I think um, you know if anyone out there, you know, a young person seeing that you know lifestyle and saying, like, oh my gosh, you know, that's like. I want to do that, you know, and that kind of thing. I think that, that you can't, you know, I mean, like, you know, you're approachable, you know, if, if someone, I mean, if someone wanted to contact you, I guess it would be rapid heart. Oh, yes. Um, uh, dot com. And you could just take a look at my, at my site and that kind of thing. I mean, if people say, how do you do it? My feeling is, you know, I mean, it's just, I think you just do what Quentin Tarantino did. You just make, you know, write the movies and direct the movies that you want yeah. to see. I mean, he does what he, what he wants to see. And, you know, I was I had the same manager as Quentin back in the day, and I remember when Quentin before Reservoir Dogs. You know, I was you know I could give Quentin a little bit of career advice. <laughs> <laughs> this is before Reservoir Dogs, so it's like, but nobody understood those scripts, and I actually saw some of the reject letters on when his scripts were sent to some very big producers in Hollywood, and I read some of the the, the, the reject letters and then the, what they thought of those scripts. No one got those scripts at all, but he just that's what he wanted to do, and he. You know, there's, there's always going to be somebody who's going to, at some point, that's going to get it. And he found that yeah. person, and um, or those people, and got his first movie going. And he has his own vision, you know, his own specific kind of vision. So you just kind of write what you want to write, and you make what you want. I know you make, have a hundred you know? stories like this. I remember when when I when we both at the at the time when we were both working at Full Moon. I remember hearing story. I think, I guess Quentin had had an interview with with Charlie, and Charlie had passed on something. You know, I mean, I mean. Oh, well, that's nothing compared to, I mean, Quentin and yeah. everybody, and uh, no one yeah. got him. I mean, I read the, I read some of those scripts early on, and I'd call Catherine, or her, her read Quentin and I's manager, I'd go, Catherine, what, what the hell is this? And she goes, I believe in this guy, and this is his vision, this is what he wants to do, and I said, good luck. Now, this is back in the old days when you, if, you know, if there wasn't a section for your movie to fit into on a blockbuster video shelf, why make it? And his stuff was very specific and very, you know, uh, retro. And it was, you know, basically, you know, Quentin was always just too hip for right. the room. And we didn't get it because, you know, and basically he turned, he, he changed the yeah. industry because suddenly you didn't have to have experience to, to, to have major movie stars work with you. Because that was always the first thing a major movie star. So what has he done right. before? Now... Now, if the major movie star says, well, hopefully he hasn't done anything because there's a good chance he could be brilliant. Um, you know, and so now he changed, I mean, he changed yeah. everything. The industry completely changed. Uh, like yeah, and remember all the, all the dialogue, the way the ref, the pop references, every, I mean, everything, you know, the writing all the way through mm -hmm. everything changed. The yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, you know, you know, I, but I, I, to me, I just, you know, it's, that, that that to me is very encouraging yeah. because you know we all have our own types of movies we like or movies we want to make and you stick with what your vision is but it just because it's brilliant doesn't mean it's going to rise to the top i mean quentin did have you know catherine james working for him uh, as his manager and she really worked hard and if you have people that'll work yeah, hard for thing, you yeah. you know you, you get you know just because it's brilliant doesn't mean it's going to rise to the top you do have to tell them to sell them uh, as David Friedman would say, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, so you have to, you know, believe in it and be able to push it. You just can't, you know, sit at Starbucks with the frappuccino saying, "Here's the script. I wonder why people haven't discovered my genius." You have to really push it, and so um, uh, uh, you know, that's uh, you know, what I, I mean, I see a lot of that, and I see a lot of you know, I've seen terrific movies at film festivals, brilliant movies, and never seen the light of day because you know. It, they just were not sold properly, you know, um, and no one picked them up. So, again, it's, uh, you know, it, and, and leave it to two concert promoters oh. to basically, you know, turn, you know, uh, 
uh, take a little, start a little company and, and, and release some of the best movies right. ever made. But it, it was their ability to get butts into seats that made those films what they were, and that's the one. Yeah, Brothers, I, I, you know. I, yeah, of course, um, they're weird. Though. They're, like, was it just like two weeks ago? Miramax. I guess they closed their doors. I mean, it's the end of Miramax. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah, the ride that they had was uh, incredible. And it's funny because. You know, I think about you mentioned David Friedman, and I think about all the stuff he talked about about being a carnival barker, working in the circus, doing everything mm-hmm. you can, and then taking that and moving it into films. That whole sell kind of thing, and then you look mm-hmm. at like it's all it's sales, all sales. Jerry. I hate to no, be a mercenary no, about it. It really is. And and the reason Miramax failed was not because you know the films weren't right. that good. Maybe they were. I didn't see many of them. Uh, but it, it failed when they when the Weinstein right. brothers Absolutely. sold it. I mean, if Merrimax just happened to be the name, the, the, the banner they were working under, those two guys were indefatigable. Yeah. They are, they're concert promoters. I mean, to get butts into seats and be there on the front lines and do that and have the tenacity and energy to be able to do that, that's what distribution is. You know, and I tell you, these guys, you know, um, they might have stumbled on recently with some of their uh, releases under the Weinstein Company, but they still have it. You know, they still have it. They'll, they'll, they'll you know... Um, it's just a, it's an oddball market. Why Grindhouse failed, I don't know. It should have been a huge hit, but no one cared, and I don't know why no well, one cared. Know. But why did Inglor- why did Inglorious Bastards become a hit? There's a movie that I thought, man, probably not going to do so well. Does does the does the Matrix generation care about you know uh, a bunch of guys busting up Nazis? Yeah. Does, you know, <laughs> does it really? But apparently well, they it's, did. It's weird, like it, you know. But, so, but, um, but you know, uh, Grindhouse is one of the films where. I, when I, I went on opening day uh, and saw it in uh, Sherman I Oaks, too. and I remember as soon as um, Quentin's segment was over, people got up and – I mean they got up and – or no, which was it his – uh, whatever it was after the first segment, Robert oh, Rodriguez, yeah. After that segment ended, people got up and left. I mean half the theater, like they didn't realize that there was two movies, you know, and uh, – I Yeah, no one got that. And let me tell you something. They promoted that movie for yeah. a year. Prior to it opening, everybody knew what that thing was. It had the two hot directors. It was horror. It was two movies for the price of one. It was trailers. It was three hours. It was everything you could possibly. We're going to give you more entertainment per dollar than you could possibly imagine. And uh, trailers and cool and this and promotions and internet and everything was so – it was like this – I mean I was just dying to see it. I was living in Montreal at the time, and I went opening day, and I went – and I went to a matinee, and there was about – I was a little shocked. I saw a line in, in front of the theater as I arrived, and people were in line for Blades of Glory, um, and uh, which had already been open for a week, and no one was in line for Grindhouse. And I said, oh. Yeah. And I went into the theater, and there was about 18 of us sitting in there. And I go, oh, Jesus well, Christ. And I watched it, and I liked I liked it. Now, the thing is, is that, you know, I, I mean, I liked, the Robert Rodriguez one, Quentin's was, was exactly what Quentin usually does. Um, I like the trailers. I think that that Thanksgiving trailer is the best thing you want to watch. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and uh, it's, you know, um, uh, and uh, but uh, they weren't Grindhouse yeah. movies. I mean, the, the, the first one, Planet Terror, uh, was not a Grindhouse right. movie. Um, and neither was the Car Chase yeah. one. It was not, they were not Grindhouse movies. And you know, to spend thirty-eight million dollars on it—I mean, come on, guys. Yeah. I mean, they should, they should, they, here's a million bucks. Go make your movie. If you can't make it for a million, let's not call it Grindhouse. I mean, the con, the idea behind that should have been these should have been real oh, cheap, absolutely. you know. And and it could still been as looked as good as they were, but I don't know. It's just weird. And then, of course, no one went in that week opening week, and I was like, oh my yeah. god, the Weinstein's and Quentin and Rodriguez all failed. <laughs> And it was a real – that was like a surprise to me because I liked it. I liked both of them. I mean I, I liked the trailers more than I liked the two movies they yeah. gave and people. And, I, and, I, and then I would ask like-minded people here you know, when I came to L.A. I said, what happened? And I'd ask people who should have gone to see that, people who love Grindhouse. And I said, why didn't you go see that? Like, well, three hours is a long time to say. I was like – Dude, we all went to see Titanic, and that was longer. I mean, what? what, what it, somehow there was a disconnect, and I don't know if it was heavily promoted, yeah, overly yeah. promoted. Well, or I know that when that. I don't know it what was, it was. You know, I saw it that you know that opening Friday. I mean, I mean, maybe I saw it. I don't know. Did it open before? Maybe maybe it had special Wednesday. I don't know, but whatever it was the next day, I was in Hancock Park, 
and I was you know walking down you know, to the village pizza place and there were, this guy that usually sells you know bootleg DVDs had had um, Grindhouse already burned onto you know DVD and I was like that was like wow how, that's just amazing you know I, I guess uh, you've got I want to say like we have like you have four or five projects about to come out right I mean I think I was looking. Well, I was, it, was, it was a very – last April or May, I can't remember what it was, I had six movies released theatrically in one mm, month. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. It was ridiculous. Yeah. So they here in L.A. at the Regent Showcase Theater, they did Dave Dakota Film Festival. You get a triple feature, mm-hmm. right? Uh, triple feature, uh, two weeks in a row, so two triple features. Get to see three movies for the price of one. I think nine people showed up <laughs> <laughs> the entire run. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, we had like the lowest per screen average of any movie, I think, in the you history of You are so hard on um, us. That and, is not uh, true at but, all. <laughs> but it was, it was just, again, we advertised, we promoted everything. Just, again, people, I just, you know, I'm sorry. It's just getting people to go to the theater is tough. But anyways, it was an oddball theater, yeah. too. It's just kind of tough to park there and stuff. So we tried it. It, 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 it did okay. But it, but. Those are all out, and I've got a lot of movies on Here TV, um, and you can see some of the films for free, actually, at gay.com, G-A-Y dot com. Uh, you can see, like, Killer Bash for free and stuff like that, and then if you join this premium number, you get the other movies. So a lot of it is going into the the the, the, the um, uh, broadband-type deliveries. Right. Um, here TV is a video on demand uh, network available pretty much nationwide, have, and you can see some. some have you thought there. about doing that with Rapid Heart? I just look at the whole um, business right now, and I look at the amount of effort it's going to take to do that. It's a little daunting, uh, but I, I, I I'm getting I, th- that may yeah. happen. That may actually happen. So um, you never well, know. I have uh, to say, I, could, I'm excited happen. about the new films that are coming out. Body Blow sounds like that's going to be a lot of fun. That's film. That film's shot in the Philippines, and. Uh, Probably, yes. Well, I just basically, I, I, the Body Blow is a, um, a, a martial arts movie, uh, kind of like I said, a kung fu movie I made in um, in the Philippines, and I've always, I grew up on the Serio Santiago kickboxing wow. movies in, in the Philippines, so I wanted to go and make one there, and uh, I did, and I uh, it was extremely challenging. I had like four typhoons that hit, I had tsunamis and terrorist wow. attacks and things like that in those five weeks I was down there. But, you know, I braved through it and got it done. I mean, nothing's going to stop me from making films. I mean, I, I when I parachuted into Romania in 1994, every other director got 10 weeks to make a movie, and they only gave me two weeks. And I, you know, brought both pictures in ahead of schedule. I mean, I was able to take 90 non-speaking Romanians, and, you know, I was there to shape a nation <laughs> and change the entire communist work ethic and say we're going to make these pictures in 12 days yeah. or else, you know, and we did, and I... You know, um, uh, so I, nothing was going to stop me. I did a, 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 a thriller, a horror thriller down in South Africa, and, you know, I, I had a great crew on it, and they shot it in eight days, which had never been done and, uh, in that in that country. And also in, in British Columbia, I did the first two eight-day movies of the week in uh, British Columbia. So, um, you know, uh, you know, nothing's going to stop me from getting these movies made, and if I really set my mind to it, I get it done, and people seem happy. And, um, you know, to me, it's, uh, you know, I, I love a good challenge and I love, um, I love to work, but, you know, you know, I've got these, uh, you know, I made, I just made a, a movie called Son of a Witch, which is probably going to be a brotherhood, probably brotherhood seven. Wow. And, uh, that's done. And, um, I shot HG Wells, the food of the gods. Um, and I shot that in Puerto Rico and in here in, uh, is Palo that, has that been finished yet? And, uh, we're editing now. Um, and, uh, we, and I, the body blows almost done and, uh, puppet master, uh, puppet, the new puppet master, which I did in China is editing right wow. now too. I've got a couple things I'm going to be doing this year. Yeah, no, Jerry, I appreciate it. And I appreciate all the work you did on those promos back in the day and everything like that. And, um, it should be, a you know, continue doing it if you're interested. I really in, uh, like what you did. You did body blow for me. But uh, let me, yeah, just, uh, I mean, you know, we'll do a second part. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. We'll do we'll do a second part uh, on this podcast. Yeah, you know, you've got, you've got about five interested. films coming out, and I would love to, I mean, uh, I love the HD, HG Well stuff, and I'd love to hear, you know, I want to, I would love to do, let's just aim for when, when these films, you know, are out or about to come out, and let's do it, mm-hmm. let's do a part two, because I really want to, Sort of had to try to focus more on rapid heart, but there's just you know you've got this ten year 
anniversary, and I, I'd, I'd really like to um, maybe just focus on, you know, on that, you know. Um, on, on. Great, absolutely. Thanks so much for doing the podcast. For sure, Jerry, and uh, let's be in touch, right. okay? Right, okay, you take too. care. Bye-bye.